So we are talking about... Mortality. Knowing of our own inevitable demise and the difficulty of living with both the certainty and uncertainty of death. You have a lot of thoughts on this, don't you? Uh, yeah, like nonstop. So share them. When I was a kid and I was working on a project, I would always get anxious because I would feel like, what if I die before I finish this? What if I go outside tomorrow and a giant anvil falls on my head and I die and I don't ever finish this? My parents will find this unfinished piece of writing sitting on my computer and it'll be terrible and they won't know what to do with it. The idea of dying with something unfinished used to haunt me a lot. Even if you finish it and then die, what's the difference really? As a teenager, as one does, I got really obsessed with death and if I were cooler, I probably would have become a goth, but I was not that cool, so I was just a really morbid, depressed nerd. I had all these anxieties and fears, but I was trying to confront them head on. I actually did a lot of writing and artwork that was sort of trying to reckon with the concept of mortality, and it was all really bad, overblown, and just dreadful, but it was part of working out a problem that obviously every human being has to work out at some point like oh sh I'm going to die someday and what does that mean I'm inevitably not going to be around forever to see the results of everything that I've done so what am I sitting in a cubicle for or what am I doing behind a cash register it really takes you out of yourself and out of everyday life there's a pretty well known I think Calvin and Hobbes comic that I really like and again this is something that I came across when I was pretty young like 10 or 11 years old it influenced me a lot like Calvin and Hobbes in general was one of my early influences but there's this comic where I believe it's annotated in the 10th anniversary book it's been a while I don't have that book anymore it actually starts with this very realistic ink drawing of a dead bird that I think he actually found Bill Watterson actually found this dead bird and drew it and that became the first panel of this comic where Calvin and Hobbes find a dead bird and Calvin says once it's too late you appreciate what a miracle life is you realize that nature is ruthless and our existence is very fragile temporary and precious but to go on with your daily affairs you can't really think about that which is probably why everyone takes the world for granted and why we act so thoughtlessly it's very confusing i suppose it will all make sense when we grow up it actually makes less sense once you grow up that's the whole point that's the punchline i think there's this notion when we're children that one day we'll understand what this is all about this will all make sense when i am what this is all for and I think when you make that realization that you're not going to understand that it doesn't get easier that there is no plan and that none of this will ever make sense this is fine I think that's like the moment when you actually really grow up I think the arts can be a comfort not always a comfort but someone else is acknowledging this reality that is unavoidable can be frightening and confusing we're all gonna have to die essentially alone even if you're surrounded by your friends and family and all your worldly goods ultimately the dying part is a solo thing like nobody else is going with you but I think art kind of bridges that divide where everyone else is thinking about that too making art about that is a way of connecting with others when I was little I wasn't sure if anybody else was thinking the same thoughts or having the same worries as me which is kind of an egocentric thing that you grow out of but for me it was always very comforting when I discovered someone else talking about the same things that I was thinking about privately, so it wasn't just suffering alone in my own head, thinking thoughts that no one else had ever had before. When I was a kid, I read this dry, scientific, factual account of how the sun was going to engulf the Earth someday, and I was like, why are people not freaking out about this? Why are people not <laughs> losing their minds in the streets? That really freaked me out. Like, I would lie awake at night thinking about when the sun got really big and ate the Earth, and then my Sonic the Hedgehog doll would be gone, and all the papers I did in school would be gone. And it's a little hard to conceive of when you're like six years old and don't have abstract thinking mastered yet. But before the end of the universe, I worried about volcanoes and earthquakes and basically any disaster that could happen. I probably went through a phase of worrying obsessively about it. So I was always kind of fixated on this idea of impermanence versus permanence and making things to last versus how long they last and leaving something behind as a legacy and what the value of that is. And years later, I remember hearing this VNV Nation song further. The lines in the song, he's talking about when the sun burns out. 
will any of this matter? That was one of the first VMV Nation songs that I remember hearing and being like, wow, wow, this guy gets it. This guy freaking gets it. That moment of, wow, somebody else has been here and had the same feelings as me. It sort of gives artists a destination when it comes to creating their work. In the grand scheme of things, what we're really trying to do is create that connection. You can put something out there that came from deep inside of you that communicates your deepest, most personal experiences and put it out in the world so that somebody else can see that and know that they're not alone. And I think that's an important function of the arts. I think we should discuss our favorite examples of art that deals with death. Oh boy! <laughs> I could go for hours on this. Is he insane or just fascinated with death? I would argue that Haibane Renme deals a lot with death and the concept of an afterlife and loss and grief. One of the things I think they did really well with that show in particular is that they maintained the mystery aspect of almost everything in that show. They kept the mystery going to the end. They didn't reveal any more than what they had to. You always have these stories and then they'll set up some sort of mysterious thing or whatever and then later in the series they'll explain it to you and it's like, oh, that's what that was. In this show in particular, they intentionally leave most of the stuff unexplained and I think the intention behind that was to sort of illustrate that death is a mystery and it remains a mystery. You never find out what's beyond the walls of the city. You never find out what happens to the Haibane after their day of flight. And a lot of the stuff that does get revealed is revealed in a way that you kind of have to infer it. I think even making it so that you have to infer it makes it that much more powerful and more realistic because you don't always get to see beyond that wall. But there's still a way to make that mystery meaningful and make it sacred and important even if you don't have all the answers. I kind of like any type of visual art that emphasizes that death is an intrinsic and inseparable part of life. When things die, every part of that thing that was alive becomes a part of something else that's alive. The material, the energy, all of it ends up becoming part of something else. Even if there is some deeper meaning or experience behind it, which we can't confirm or deny, there's no way to know, and I think that we're not supposed to know. Even in the absence of that, we know for a fact that the physical manifestation of ourselves gets redistributed. We're not just existing on borrowed time, we're literally borrowing everything. We're borrowing our physical form from the universe. We're borrowing our present from the future and from the past. I also like it when people try to emphasize the reverberations that a life can have. Like in Xenosaga. Even the smallest of waves can spread throughout the whole. I always like the idea that something that you made, a work that you did, would someday sort of develop a life of its own and sort of sustain itself. There's a concept in a lot of cultures, particularly the Day of the Dead. No one is really gone as long as they're remembered. Your life touches other lives, and as long as it continues to resonate with people who are still alive, you're not really gone. You know, you're not gone until you're forgotten. I've seen people doing that after Terry Pratchett died. While he's remembered, he's not really gone because people are still reading his works and and keeping his words alive. You know, the idea of being survived by your work is a very potent motivator for a lot of artists, I think. I have this picture, this photo, that I think I reblogged on Tumblr like nine years ago. It's a building, and written on the side of the building are the words, make something or be forgotten. And my commentary when I reblogged the image, I said, I think this explains my entire life, though now it'd be more like make something even though you'll be forgotten. I used to have this obsession with creating something that would last forever, but then I realized that's kind of impossible since anything I leave behind will be forgotten too, even if it outlives me for a while. So I think the best I can hope for is to make something that lasts as long as it's needed, reaches anyone who might be able to relate to it, and maybe changes a tiny piece of the universe in some weird little insignificant way. Or not. <laughs> I had to add the disclaimer, or not, because I didn't want to sound conceited, but that's kind of been my philosophy for a while. We don't know how long something is going to last that we make, but you want to put that out into the universe anyway because why not? Along with that, which I thought I had linked it in that post that I made, but I guess I was thinking of something else. Years ago, I went to the Philadelphia Art Museum and there was this installation exhibit by an artist named Zoe Leonard, I think. 
and it was called Strange Fruit. The story behind this art is it was created by the artist after a friend of theirs died. It was a bunch of skins of different types of fruit, like banana peels and oranges, sewn together and decorated in some way on the floor of this big room in the middle of the museum, just scattered all over the floor. The point of the exhibit, part of it was that the fruit would decay and change over time because obviously fruit is very perishable. I was like 15, 16 years old when I saw this. I was like, why would you make an art piece out of something that's so temporary, it's so transient, and it's literally rotting before your eyes. You're just putting all these pieces of organic matter that are just going to decay. But then I thought about it more and I was like, well, all art decays eventually, you know. My grandmother used to make enamels and she said the only way you can destroy an enamel is hit it with a hammer or bury it in the ground because the dirt will eat away at the enamel. But even those things can't be preserved forever. No matter how durable your medium is, it still has a fixed and finite lifespan. That really kind of blew my mind. <laughs> when I was like 15, I was like, whoa. That's one of my favorite art pieces that deals directly with death and impermanence and decay. You in that same vein, in talking about works of art that express our feelings about mortality, I think you have put a lot of work into an entire world of your own creation. Eh, yeah, well, I haven't put much work into it lately, so it's on hiatus while I get my shit together, which may be indefinitely, but, you know, someday my shit will get together. This is actually a drawing that I did a few years ago in 2017, around the time that an album called Soul by Seeming came out. Soul, a self-banishment ritual is the full title of the album. The first song on that album is called Doomsayer. The lyrics to that song and just the general tone of the album and a lot of Seeming's work, a lot of Alex Reed's work, I associate with this character. Basically just like Seeming's entire discography <laughs> and a little bit from Thou Shalt Not. Doomsayer in particular is very apocalyptic. It begins, I'm pacing by the highway, I'm ranting on the witness stand, there's a skipping record in my mouth. I'm grabbing hold of strangers around me, warning happiness this is just a distraction from the one thing I can't seem to shut up about. All you madmen retreating to the mountains, you astronomers who keep on counting, I know how it feels when only one thing is real. All you forgotten half-wits in the attic, finding God as you stare into static, I know what it's like when your family cries, I know how it feels. It's a feeling that I've had for a long time, that the world was going to end and civilization was going to collapse in my lifetime, and all these kind of vaguely Cassandra-esque things that may or may not have just been a manifestation of my anxieties, but that felt at least a little bit prophetic in the past couple years. I feel like I and a lot of other people have been saying, we told you this would happen, we knew this was going to happen, but no one listened to us. In that way, I feel like we're all kind of doomsayers. As far as a connection to this character, when he's younger, he's in this sort of apocalyptic death cult. He was kind of forcibly recruited because he has a certain ability, these powers that are kind of rare in that world and kind of dangerous. So he has this power and this sect exists to control people with that power and carry out its own agenda by manipulating them. Pretty early on, he figured out the larger agenda that they had. I don't want to say prophetic because it wasn't really a prophecy, but he kind of predicted what was going to happen and what was going to end up being basically the central conflict of the story. Because of that, and because he tried to stop them, he got not only kicked out of the warlock death cult, but he also was given a punishment, which was so horrific that it caused him to see the true nature of the universe. It's confronting the end of everything, right? At the end of that, this guy is still, I wouldn't exactly say sane, but he's still like functioning, which is the equivalent of staring at the sun for days and not going blind. Would they not worship that man as a god after that happens? Or do they see that happen and say, uh-oh? What's funny, uh-oh? Yeah, it's more of an uh-oh situation because <laughs> they've already denounced him for breaking their rules. So now he's even escaped their punishment. They basically see him as like this horrible abomination. And he manages to escape and runs off halfway across the world and just lives in the woods for a year or two. He's still tormented by this thing that he saw and this revelation that he witnessed and the fact that the death cult is still 
trying to bring this about. So eventually when he gets found by some other people who are sort of the neutral party in the story, he tries to warn them, but they don't really listen because they think he's nuts. TLDR version, he was in a death cult, he received this revelation, and so he spent pretty much the rest of his life trying to oppose them and enlist the aid of anyone who would listen. But because he's so traumatized, it's a little hard for him to communicate with others. I think it's a really interesting analogy for how it can feel sometimes when you know something or are at least keenly aware of something that nobody wants to talk about. I know how it feels like when the only end of one the world or the end of real. civilization or your certain demise. I think it's important to resist the urge to try to put a positive spin on everything. A lot of these things are not necessarily fun or glamorous or good or bad or anything. Yeah, well, you can't really apply like a moral judgment to the unfeeling laws of the universe. We live in a very indifferent universe. Trying to find meaning in everything can be kind of a fruitless endeavor. I think one very important function of art is to address what is otherwise unspeakable for every definition of unspeakable. Things that are otherwise out of place in everyday life and things that you can't really talk about in small talk or casual conversation and things that are terrible to contemplate like death and the end of the universe. There are three things they have learned never to discuss with people. Religion, politics, and the great pumpkin. The thought of dying, the realization that it's inevitable. You know, both of those things are sort of depressing and can definitely color everyday life, especially when it's hard to not think about, and especially when those aspects of our lives become a little bit more at the forefront. Like right now? Like right now. But I would say that they should both serve as a perpetual reminder that we have time, but not an infinite amount of time, and that the time that we have should be used wisely. Yeah, that's the whole point of the memento mori in art. What's that? It means like a reminder of death, basically. People would draw like a skull or some dead flowers and be like, I put this in here to remind people who look at this artwork that they're going to die someday and that you should use your time wisely. Obviously, death in artwork has a very storied iconography, but that would take a couple art history courses to get into. I think it's important to remember that the time that you have is limited and that you need to spend it doing the things that you find important with the people that you find important. Memento Mori, motherfuckers. Well, we would like to remind you to like and subscribe. <laughs> of course. If you have any thoughts on mortality and would like to share in the comment section, we would love to hear what you think. Post them in the doobly-doo. Yep, yeah, sure. Post them in the doobly-doo. We also wanted to announce that we now have a Twitch account. So we do a live stream every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Monday, Wednesday at 8 o'clock, and Friday night at 9. So if you'd like to come and check us out there, we would really love to meet you. And you can uh, join us in chat while we're painting and hang out with us. and Watch us be boring. Yeah, watch us be boring. <laughs> 